summer fade and winter draw near. My Lord, in your presence I live without fear. Through tempest, through snows, through turbulent tide, the touch of your hand is my strength and my guide. I ask for no riches that death can destroy. I crave only thee, your love and your joy. I ask for no riches that death can destroy. I crave only thee, your love and your joy. The dancers will pass, the singing must end. I welcome the darkness with you for my friend. Good morning again. Nice to see you. So this week's reading from Rays of the One Light is entitled, The Redeeming Light. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The book of Isaiah in the Bible, chapter 9, tells us, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. What is this light of which so many scriptures speak? In Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramhansa Yogananda, we read of, it, we read of an early experience the Master had with that light. I was blessed about the age of eight with a wonderful healing through the photograph of Lahiri Mahashaya. This experience gave intensification to my divine love. While at our family estate in Ichapur, Bengal, I was stricken with Asiatic cholera. My life was despaired of. The doctors could do nothing. At my bedside, Mother frantically motioned me to look at Lahiri Mahashai's picture on the wall above my head. Bow to him mentally. She knew I was too feeble even to lift my hands in salutation. If you really show your devotion and inwardly kneel before him, your life will be spared. I gazed at his photograph and saw there a blinding light enveloping my body and the entire room. My nausea and other uncontrollable symptoms disappeared. I was well. At once I felt strong enough to bend over and touch mother's feet in appreciation of her immeasurable faith in her guru. Mother pressed her head repeatedly against the little picture. O oh, omnipresent master, I thank thee that thy light hath healed my son. I realized that she too had witnessed the luminous blaze through which I had instantly recovered from a usually fatal disease. <coughs> Where my light is, God once told a saint whom the divine light had healed, no darkness can dwell. The divine light, pure, calm, liberating, is the only final cure for every kind of delusion, ill health, emotional grief, and spiritual ignorance. Seek it daily in the silence, in deep meditation. As the Bhagavad Gita says in the fifth chapter, for whom that, that darkness of the soul is chased by light, splendid and clear, shines manifest the truth, as if a sun of wisdom sprang to shed its beams of light. Thus through Holy Scripture God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om. I was thinking about this topic and title because it's not just the light. 
we know, as Swamiji explained, about the light being so prevalent as spoken of in uh, all religions, really. And we begin to discover that the light versus darkness is not just a metaphor or a poetic image that that which is good is light and that which isn't is darkness. But <clears throat> as we grow spiritually, as we grow inwardly, and as we in a way have more mystical experiences, we realize that light is a real experience. It's a real uh, light <laughs> that you see. And as Master said, it's a light of a thousand suns, but it is not a burning light. It is not a painful, intense light, whereas the light of even one sun here hurts our eyes. He said that sun, that inner light, does not at all, though much more intense, does no harm in that way. In fact, this word mystical, I realized just when saying it, is a little bit of an unhelpful word. It is helpful in the sense of, we usually use it with mysticism means someone who uh, likes, someone who pursues or has an experience inwardly of the divine. But mystical comes from the same English word as a root as mystery, you know, as hidden. And on one level it's true. These experiences that we have are hidden initially from us and then we seek them. Also, once we have them, they're hidden from others, or at least ought to be. But the real thing about mysterious and, you know, you can't really know the truth of them, that's the problem. That's where mystical is not helpful when it's related to, again, mysterious, unknowable, vague, secret. And uh, secret in the way of secret being kept from all of us. That's the real challenge. That's why, in a way, there's nothing, there's nothing mysterious about any of these uh, experiences that we have about the science of awakening. It seems mysterious without understanding of yoga. Because yoga addresses itself to how to become spiritually awakened, how to see that light and even talks about the light, even describes the light that you see in meditation ultimately as the spiritual eye, which one day we have to get on this altar because I always point at it and people think I'm pointing at this little beige disc up here and I'm not. I'm pointing at where the spiritual eye is going to end up someday, that it's a gold ring and with a blue interior and a five-pointed white star in the middle. Now that Light, described again as a universal experience, it's sometimes portrayed in Christianity as a, seeing a blue, uh, like in some churches you'll see a blue circle at the top of the altar with a, with a bird, a dove spread with its wings spread like this, which of course is a five-pointed thing because its two tail feathers, you know, like this are pointed that way. So, um, when we had the uh, we had a glass blower in Italy make a spiritual eye for the temple in Italy. He said, what is that thing? I see it all the time when I go to sleep. What is, you people know something about it? And so uh, he was shocked and very touched to know that it wasn't just something he was having. And he didn't know anything about yoga. But the knowledge of yoga is in a way the science of spiritual awakening. Not even in a way, it is. And it's a science that's beyond any country and beyond any belief. It's, I mean, physics is not uh, German. You know, Isaac Newton came from England. It's not British. It's, it's, you know, in a certain way, not even only of Earth. It's beyond the Earth and so on. So, um, uh, in any case, the the light that we talk about is a real experience. But the title of this chapter is the redeeming light. It's not even the divine light, which it could be. And Swamiji, in fact, in the whole reading, refers to it, I think, as the divine light. He never says that word redeeming. And what does the word redeeming mean? When it's the, wor the word redeeming means basically that which brings you back 
that which saves you, you could say. It's often given in that sense. That which protects you, that which heals you, but ultimately that which again brings you where? Which brings you home. I was thinking that's really what the word redeeming means. Because it's often presented as you, if you need to be redeemed, you need to be saved. It sort of implies that we're in this bad state and that to be saved then we'll go to the good state and then be clean, purified in the good club. But you know, in a certain way that's true, but it's not defined by anyone else's uh, definition of good and bad or even our own. It is because we are a spark of the divine. We are the soul. And so we are the soul caught up in this ego, in this maya, with these desires, like everybody else, put here by God for some kind of strange entertainment. As Master said, it's a hobby of God. It's a terrible hobby. And so we have to not feel badly about it, but and it's, there's no concept of uh, sin and guilt and sin and all that. Again, sin, uh, all of this is just error. It's just a mistake. It's just going in the wrong direction. We really only can either go away from God or towards Him. And so there's nothing to feel badly about. And in fact, as we were talking about two Sundays ago, feeling badly is just one other way of behaving wrongly. So again, that doesn't mean if you feel badly to then feel badly about feeling badly because, oh, that's wrong to just forget it. Just get out and, you know, go for a walk or something, you know, just let's move the energy when we're in that state. But just to say that it is when we're, we're not being brought away from darkness into light, we're being taken from darkness and brought back home. It's our natural state and we all seek it. It's what we've come from. The soul is a spark of God and as it has gone out from God long ago, so it eventually has to come back. That's it. Come back home. And in fact, it really completes the journey in a complete uh, zero. In fact, Swamiji said, every plus has to be balanced by a minus. It has to be. Otherwise, you'd end up with a little bit of a plus in the ledger. God said, oh, no, not all finished. Go back out and have one more experience, then come back. So he said, really, it's kind of staggering to think that all of this striving is for nothing, is to achieve nothing. In fact, one uh, monk in India took this so far uh, as to take the name Shunyabhai, of course, which means z brother zero. <laughs> and so he went to America and shared these things. In fact, um, those of you who know Asha, she said to him when she was, she said, brother zero, it's uh, not much of a name, is it? And he said, I know myself, it is a very good name for me. <laughs> and so, so anyway, we're striving to achieve nothing. But really, it's not really nothing. You could think of it as also clearing the balance. That's a nice feeling. In fact, we saw this one strange thing that <laughs> was posted on Facebook by one of our Ananda India groups. And it was, you know, sharing weekly inspiration. They had just started their Facebook page and they were posting different things like Ananda Pune, Ananda Gorgon, all are doing. And it was this sharing this beautiful chant of Swamiji's, I owe nothing, I am free. In myself, I am free. I owe no one, I am free. In myself, I am free. I owe no one, you know, as in debt. Not I own no one. That's the actual chant. So you could just imagine the person, I owe no one, I am free. <laughs> no EMI, the mortgage is paid, you know, on and on and on. So, no, it's, though freeing, that's not exactly what's intended here. So, in terms of this being brought back home, we see that in our lives because we all seek that. We have this innate sense that we want to be at home. Sometimes it manifests if our home in some way, especially as children, is unsatisfying with this feeling of being kind of cheated somehow. Like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to have a happy, safe, uh, you know, affluent home in the sense that whatever I want, I get. 
and everyone is nice to me no matter how I behave. And, uh, you know, just it's, it's a wonderful thing. And if we don't get that, it's just kind of, huh, how did that happen? And then as we get older, if we start to struggle with any family members, that we were laughing yesterday, uh, last week because as the Gita was saying, you know, the sage looks upon all people uh, alike, the saints, the criminals, troublemakers, relatives, <laughs> and, and even Swamiji when reading it on television said, <laughs> it's funny how he puts relatives right after troublemakers. But again, it's because that in one way you can look at it in a positive way because we don't want to always just be harping on the family even though Master said our, our relatives are given to us by God and we have to keep them if they're bad. He said, but our friends we can choose. And so in one way too you find we broaden our definition of family to include those who are in our spiritual family. And is it just imaginary or is it just kind of a nice thing to think? No, it's not. Because when you feel a bond, a spiritual bond with others who are also practicing and are children, in fact, of the same guru, if indeed it is the case, you have been with them, your guru bhais, many more times than you've been with your earthly relatives. Because you're part of a soul group Master described that there are families of souls that tend to, that, that move together, that incarnate together to produce particular works together. When, I mean, Ramakrishna said it very simply to Vivekananda that he, well, he had this, either he described it or Vivekananda, you probably know the story, of Ramakrishna as a little boy in heaven running up to this old ancient sage and saying, I'm going down, will you come? And so Ramakrishna was the little boy and he said Vivekananda was this one who then eventually came and became his disciple. Master said to one of his large disciples, physically large, Norman, a super strong man, he said, I needed a giant. And he said, and so you were born. And it wasn't arbitrary. There's that connection. Sometimes we feel that connection. We, had a, we have it all the time where someone walks into level one and we say, oh, hi, how are you? Where did we meet? Did you come? No. Well, you were at Swamiji's leg? No. Uh, did you? Vi no. Are you on faith? No, no. It's like, well, but I know I've seen you. Maybe not this life, maybe last life then. And so we, that feeling sometimes is instant, sometimes it grows. But Master also said, when you feel an easy friendship with someone, or especially an instant friendship with someone, that's effortless, the only way that's possible is because you have been working on that friendship together for lifetimes. He said, it's the only way. Why? One, one reason I think why is that in some cases we build up a trust of each other. Because it's not anything that we can even see in this life, but we know we've had so much time together. I know that person's character and I feel there's a trust. Still, even in this lifetime, you should not test it consciously, but watch and see for tests. Not so much in that friendship, but any friendship really, including that one. Because Swamiji said the difference between belief and faith is that you can believe in someone but it's only after you've seen him tested that you can have faith in him. And it's not, again, that we sit there going, well, I believe in you, but we'll see. <laughs> it's not like that. But we always hold out the highest for everyone. But we come to rely upon them when we see them passing through difficult tests, which God has arranged for them, for us also. So, going back then to this thought of going home, we have that are, I said, you, you know, you can think of relatives in a positive way in that sometimes we incarnate in families or with close friends or relatives who are exemplifying certain personality traits that we ourselves have. And in a way, they're sort of beating them out of us. You know, suppose we have a tendency to be critical, but we've learned to keep our mouth shut and only think critical thoughts. But of course, our uncle has no, is under no such obligation and is happy to just freely share all the critical thoughts at us. And so it's like, argh, argh. but sometimes it's there just to help us 
completely let go of that quality in ourselves. Suppose we have a tendency to be very mental and surrounded then by someone whose people are very intellectual doubting. Uh, why do you do that? You think that's a miracle? That's not a miracle. That's just because, you know, actually, technically, gravity, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> but it's because we had a tendency to doubt. We had a tendency to analyze and so on. And so that's what it's there for. And one way you can know that you're working on it is when that reaction is lesser inside. To say, well, you know what? I used to think that way. And, you know, I don't find as much satisfaction in thinking that way anymore. If you are going through the journey of still thinking that way, enjoy. Go ahead. I had the freedom to learn my own lessons and not in a, yeah, 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 I remember when I was like that. <laughs> no, not like that. Not judging, because who knows, maybe they'll get to path through to God through the path of jnana yoga. So maybe that's exactly what they're doing. But in any case, when that reaction is less, then we know, okay, we're making some progress. And we can measure our progress by our reaction, and I'll come back to that in, in a moment. But it was funny though, I, I'm reminded of this cartoon, maybe you saw it also, in terms of, uh, I, you know, I used to think that way. There's a picture of an old man and a little boy looking up and talking to him and saying, I understand, gra Grandpa. When I was your age, I didn't believe in reincarnation either. <laughs> so, um, in terms of uh, this thought then of the redeeming light and wanting to go home, we see it also even when everything is perfect. And in fact, it's, you have to be careful what you wish for because sometimes we can imagine, I certainly imagined, what about, I mean, for example, there was a family uh, that came to one of the free lectures in Bangalore and they were wondering whether they would want to take this level one class and get into all this Ananda Sangha Kriya Yoga stuff. So they were all interested to the husband, wife, and daughter. And they all sat in separate parts of the hall so as not to influence each other, which I thought was sweet. And so then at the end of the free lecture, they all came back together and said, so, uh, you know, what do you think? Nalaki, you know? And uh, the one said, well, you know, I kind of liked it. I liked it too! Oh, I liked it! Okay, good, let's go. And so they all went on and they eventually all took Kriya together. And you think, wow, oh, wouldn't that lucky, wouldn't that be nice? But you know, not in their case, but in another case that I know of, there was a person with a very happy family, just all kind of, you know, very happy. Everybody gets along and, you know, all these things. And we, uh, everything's pleasant and there's always food and all that. And yet it took a while for that child as an adult to when it was time to leave the family and you know do some kind of service or you know move to another Ananda community it was really hard for the child to move away just like but my family my family needs me we always get along I always help them they always help me and this was something that actually Swamiji had asked the person to do Meaning, it was obviously for their good. We can't always know, but in the, those days, it was easy to know. If he asked it, he would be thinking of that person, not of the job. Swamiji never thought in terms of the function someone would f serve. But first, was it going to be a good step for them personally, spiritually? And so, it was very hard then for that person to take that step. They did and made a great success out of it. But that was a big struggle and I saw for some of us when it's like, okay, it's time to move away from the family. <laughs> oh, well, if I must, <laughs> and just take off. But for her, it was a real tie. <laughs> Sorry, did I let something out there a little psychologically? So, um, 
So anyway, that sense of even if everything is going perfectly though, I knew one devotee on this path who she got the perfect husband she, before she was on this path. They were wealthy because both of their jobs, they were doing well, and they finally got their own home, and which in America means, you know, you take out a loan for your own home. <laughs> you never have the cash in advance. And so they had their own home. They got the mortgage. She said she went in and everything was wonderful. And she just sat down and cried because she was thinking and feeling, is this it? You know, I have all, I have the house, I have the car, I have the husband, I have everything's clean. And it's nothing. I mean, you can be absolutely miserable in a mansion. You know, it was not satisfying her heart at all. All these desires which finally were fulfilled meant nothing to her. In fact, Swamiji points out, we often learn more by having our desires fulfilled than denied. Because when you have them fulfilled, you go, ha, ah, excellent, I got to eat 60 dosas today. And then you no longer desire to eat 60 dosas because you know it doesn't work. It just causes pain. <laughs> and there's no mystery about it. Like, well, maybe 59? No, it's just, that's it, too much. And so, similarly, she had that, that vacuum still, that yearning for home. She was sitting in a beautiful home that for all intents and purposes was her home. And still she wasn't home. And that is that call that we each feel, where is my home? We are all strangers in a strange land. And we feel that at times. That's that even sometimes when we're heartbroken, Master had that chant, which was translated from <coughs> Bengali. In this world, mother, no one can love me. In this world, they do not know how to love me. Where is their pure loving love? Where is their truly loving thee? There my soul longs to be. And sometimes when we chant that, it's like, well, this is kind of depressing. But no, it's a, it's a calm truth because there is a place where there is true loving love. And how do we know? Somehow we know. Somehow our souls yearn for that. Somehow, somehow our hearts are seeking that, confident that it's there. That's partly what makes a devotee. We all yearn for that comfort, but a devotee not only seeks it in God, but believes that he will find it in God. That's one of the reasons why atheism is such a disease and a bad thing. Not because of any effect on society or anything, but the effect on the person. As it says in the Gita, the doubter is the most miserable of mortals. Why? Because in one way you can say, the heart, every heart yearns for home. But a doubter doubts that he'll ever find it. An atheist, and I don't mean an atheist like a label, but someone who doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe that home can be found. It's pretty rough to have a strong desire and to feel that it will never be satisfied. Just in principle, any desire, but especially that one. I won't ever be safe. I won't ever feel complete. I won't ever have this emptiness in my heart be filled. That is a depressing thought. And so the devotee says, I will. I know that it's there, or I know that it ought to be there, and even if I haven't seen it yet, I would rather die trying searching for it. Because if I don't search for it, then I'm dead already. There's nothing else in this world that will bring that for me. It doesn't mean we don't continue to live in this world. It doesn't mean that we don't continue to share with others and help them and all these things. But in our hearts we say, oh, there's no choice for me but to go and find that home. And I know that it's there. So many times we see people joining Ananda, especially <coughs> in the beginning when they first come. And there's that, that craving for community, that craving for spiritual friendship. I meditate and I'm at home and none of these people know anything of what I'm doing. And that was fine until it wasn't. And then I needed to connect with others. People will often say to us, 
and then suddenly they find that having developed this much in this direction, self-will, self-realization, my discipline, my sadhana, that in coming then they find that other part complete. And other people coming from the other side do too. <coughs> I like to hanging out, spending time talking about spiritual things with friends. And in coming here, I find I'm deepening my own personal routine. Because it's not enough to talk about these things or to listen to them. I want to practice because I want that experience myself. I want my own life to improve. I want Kriya Yoga, for example. I want God. I'm glad to be with others who are seeking Him, but I want Him for me, too. And so, Master said, the highest prayer is, Divine Mother, give me thyself so that I may share thee with all. Both are needed. Now, speaking to uh, non-attachment, which was the uh, affirmation today, and related in a way, Swamiji's song, Home is a Green Hill, really expresses this, both these thoughts of seeking home and non-attachment and inner freedom. Home is a green hill, home is a wind blowing betrayal far, far away. And if you've ever felt betrayed, on one level we all kind of feel betrayed by being born, I think. Just like, oh my God, what am I doing? We had a deal! <laughs> And then especially as yogis, it's kind of like, you know, going into ecstasy as we die and then coming back here and going, Oh, I thought I made it. And self-evidently I didn't. Here I am again. I think that's one reason why also sometimes you find devotees have a certain sadness. You know, there's a lot of joy, but there's also a little bit of sadness. And I think it's partly because we, that desire for God is so strong. I've prayed and prayed and prayed. And why doesn't he come? Or, why am I not there yet? And sometimes we can misinterpret it as, I must not be good enough. I mean, it's like, look, we're doing fine. Just keep going. Swamiji had a brother disciple who had a vision of Master standing in a field surrounded in light. And he said, all these disciples, the, his fellow monks of this brother disciple who was having the dream, were all running towards him. And he said, uh, sometimes some would <coughs> stumble and then fall and then get up and, you know, take a while to you know, just start walking. And then after a while they would get their courage back, which is an important point, and then continue the run. He said, in the dream, four of the, dis four of the yeah, disciples made it into the light. And he told Swamiji, you were one of them that I saw entering that light. But, and Swamiji said, did everybody fall? And the, his, the other guy said, oh sure, everybody fell. And that's part of what happens is that when we stumble, we just have to get our courage back. And that means every day when we fail to meet whatever expectations we had or something goes horribly wrong or we're so pleased about how calm we are, bang up! You know, just suddenly all this anger comes flying out. Why? Well, because it's hot. No, I'm only partly kidding. You know, you find everybody's voice starts to escalate as the temperature starts to escalate also. Just too hot. It just makes everybody mad. And so, in any case, when we go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just shouted like that. Oh, I'm not growing anywhere. Just reset the counter. From today onward, I will go forward better. I'll do more. Divine Mother, you've got to help me. All these things to keep our courage high. Because why? It's practical. We have no other choice. Do we want to go backwards? Do we want to sit still? No. So, fine. Okay, no problem. Cut through it. Go forward. Now, <clears throat> Home is a green hill, home is a wind, blowing betrayal far, far away. Home is the knowledge, heaven is near. Home's the end of the fray, meaning end of the battle. And how many times do we, some, do we seek that? Just, can I reach the end and be done? We can, but not in this world, but in that freedom. Home is my heart's land. Home's where I am. Nothing can dim the light of my soul. Home is forever. Home is today. Home's a heart that is whole. W-H-O-L-E. And that's another thought to remember that once our heart becomes whole and filled, then we're home. 
in itself. Because why? Because we're carrying that home inside, as Master said. Meditation gives you a portable paradise. So rather than going just to Goa or Fisherman's Cove or any kind of paradise, you have that paradise inside all the time. Uh, Kovalo, maybe. So uh, then uh, sometimes I dream that life is a play. Laughter forever and skies never gray. Which again, you hear often expressed. But when I'm silent, freed from all care, meaning all desires, all worries, all anything that brings our energy out of the heart. I discover my homes everywhere. And that last thought is really one, is a secret to achieving this. But when I'm silent, of course in meditation, but also free from all care, when those desires are all gone, it isn't that we become dull. In fact, life becomes so much more enjoyable. I discover my homes everywhere. And so, sometimes we're not aware of our desires. Just like, I don't know, I, I don't want money because I'm told I'm not supposed to want it. And uh, I don't want safety because I believe it's only in God or that's what they tell me. Or I don't really want, you know, just, I don't want to want anything because I'm not supposed to want it. And I want to not want it, so I don't want it. You know, we can even get, or we can just lock the heart after being burnt enough times or hit enough times. I, I, I don't feel like having anything because I don't feel anything at all. And you find that too, people come on the path. The heart is just locked for, the sheer, for self-preservation. Just If I felt, I would just die. So I don't feel. <laughs> and we, sometimes actually we have to do that. Like soldiers, we just have to march on. And then sometimes we make it through a terrible crisis, like a lawsuit or a, the house burns down or all these things. And then once the house is rebuilt or the office fire is put out or the lawsuit is finished, then we dissolve into a puddle because suddenly we allow our heart to open and feel all the trauma and stress that there was. But in terms of how do we get in touch with our desires? In fact, I want to make a point about that locked heart. Swamiji points out that numbness in the heart is not the absence of feeling. It is trapped feeling. So if you're at a point where you feel kind of numb, I don't feel anything, then try to understand, try to explore in any way you can. What am I trapping? What am I holding locked up? It's the natural state of the heart to be open and to flow and to feel all kinds of things and generally more and more good things and calm things, calm, feel calmly. But if it feels numb, then say, what is it that I'm avoiding? What is it I'm afraid of? What is it I'm stuffing? Because it's just choking your energy. And so it may be time to release it. And so we sometimes find people after Kriya initiation suddenly go through these sort of emotional turmoils. Not often, but sometimes. Because they have shaken some of this karma loose or, and, and shaken the heart open. Because it's time to open it. But then sometimes old things, sometimes people even weep over things they had forgotten happened to them. Not because they forgot, but because they chose to forget. And then it is healed and suddenly they sometimes find themselves 10 years younger because all that energy is freed. So keep that in mind when I don't feel anything. And the other is when what I was saying about we have desires but we don't even know that we have them. One simple way to diagnose a desire or detect a desire is to notice if you ever get angry. And again, I'm speaking very personally there in that when we get angry, as even Krishna says to Arjuna and Master said to Swamiji, anger is, comes from when you desire something and your desire is thwarted, is denied, is stopped. So if ever there is any surge of irritation, ah, oh, I found a desire because I didn't get what I wanted and now I'm angry. Because I'm angry, it was because of some desire somewhere. Now. I had a hard time with that at first because it was like, you know, someone would walk up to me and sort of verbally punch me in the face. Ah, and I'd be angry. And they'd be like, you had a thwarted desire. What, I desired for them to punch me in the face? No, they did that. So no, that, that's not it. I desired 
that they not punch me in the face. Oh, okay, that was the desire. I was just minding my own business. I wasn't doing anything. And this came. And so there's no desire in there, but there is. I desire to be spoken to in a certain kind of way. I desire that when I'm standing in line, that the person doesn't just <laughs> go right up front like that. That's a desire. <laughs> I desire that this person behave in this way and then it will be fine. So you start to discover, oh, why do I desire all these things? Or how can I calmly say, vain down. <laughs> you know, how can I, I don't have to just hit back. I don't also have to go, okay, that's fine. If you want to buy your public eye first and, <laughs> and oh, you do too? Okay, you know, you know, we don't have, there's a middle ground, a calm middle ground between those two. Otherwise, the shop is closing and you're still there in line. <laughs> so keep this in, all of these things in mind in terms of freeing yourself of desires. And in one big desire which uh, we have to integrate into ourselves. I was thinking about this earlier. In the Naya Swami order we have the pilgrim vow is the first vow for anyone entering this order. Living life as a renunciate inwardly, which again is the only way to live renunciation. We can also live it outwardly. But if we do it outwardly without doing it in inwardly, it's useless. And if we do it inwardly and not outwardly, it's fine. Because inwardly is where the work is, in this heart, in this mind. And so um, the, uh, the stages then after that, you can become a brahmachari, you can become a tyagi if you're married, and uh, then, but both then lead to becoming a nayaswami. And so in the vow that the nayaswamis take, it is, um, uh, how does it begin? I will, it's the, not the first vow, uh, not the first line of the vow, but the second line is, um, I will never take a partner, or if I am married, I will see my partner as belonging only to thee, Lord. And that's also the part of the vow that is, represents celibacy. But then it goes on, because why? I mean, okay, that's nice, I guess, but why? Because in any case, it says, I will, in any case, well, I've got to say, I will never take a partner, or if I am married, I will see my partner as belonging only to thee, Lord. In any case, I am complete in myself, and in myself will merge all the opposites of duality. So when we are seeking that mate, and if we're married too, still, that, that innate balance between male and female is really between masculine and feminine and that we need each of us to balance in ourselves and to even affirm that I'm complete in myself and in myself will merge all the opposites of duality. You often find, uh, in fact, male saints are very soft usually and female saints are very tough and so even on the spiritual path among devotees, you usually find men becoming softer, women becoming stronger. I don't mean they're not strong to begin with, but I just mean that inner balance that comes is what we're seeking and need to manifest in ourselves. So we can take inspiration from all kinds of sources, whether we're married or not, but really to feel this is something I am completing myself. Sometimes people say, you complete me. But it really has to be, I complete me. But really, of course, ultimately it is, you uh, are me. So, God bless you.